My name is Sarah Nelson. I started researching this plane crash as a case study for my aviation law students. I share this now in fond memory of Heidi Sue Dowland, who was killed in the crash. Who am I? Well, I'm a pilot since 1994, an ATP airline transport pilot and a CFI, a flight instructor in single multi-engine and instrument airplanes. I'm a lawyer since 2014, licensed in the state of Arizona, and since 2015, a professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, the best aviation university in the world. I volunteer with the FAA safety team out of the Scottsdale FISDO as a safety rep and a drone pro. I'm also the author of two legal textbooks and co-author of three other legal textbooks. I have a passion for all flying things and law and dogs and even motorcycles. The primary reason I made this video is educational. Educational for my students at Embry-Riddle who are using it as a case study in aviation law and educational for the rest of the world so that Heidi's memory would live on. I begin here with the background of the story gathered from news articles when this case first came across my radar. On January 16, 2024, this is the newspaper article that sparked my interest in this case. Prescott Valley Man faces federal charge of involuntary manslaughter in 2019 plane crash. This appeared in the Daily Courier in Prescott. A traffic stop on Interstate 15 in Washington City over the weekend led to the arrest of a man wanted on a federal warrant issued out of Arizona. On Sunday, the pilot, 47-year-old Christopher Adam Anderson, was arrested in Washington County shortly after 2 p.m. Anderson is facing federal charges, including one count of involuntary manslaughter and one count of registration violations involving an aircraft. The case was filed following a plane crash reported on January 13, 2019, involving a Piper aircraft that crashed near Kingman, Arizona. The aircraft was carrying two occupants, including Anderson, the pilot, and a 38-year-old passenger and owner of the plane who was killed in the crash. And Anderson is scheduled to make an initial appearance in U.S. District Court in St. George later this week. Until then, he remains on a federal hold in Washington County. This is Cody Blowers reporting for St. George News, your number one source for local news. Taking a look now at the people involved. This is Christopher Adam Anderson, the pilot of the plane crash from 2019. And this is his girlfriend of three and a half years, Heidi Sue Dowland, who was killed in the crash. This photograph shows Heidi Sue Dowland on the left, beside her daughter, Maya Devine, her youngest son, Dustin Dowland, and on the far right, her other son, Logan Dowland. Heidi Sue Dowland also left behind an older sister named Hannah Morgan and a mother named Sue Ellen Morgan. Hannah is quoted as saying that the three of them were like the three amigos. At the time of her death, Heidi Sue Dowland was the owner of the Prescott Med Spa, located on 8196 East Florentine Road in Prescott Valley. What I'm about to share now is an extremely concise legal background to the story so that you will see the case from all angles. A story such as this Anderson case has to be seen through three lenses of aviation law, the administrative, the civil, and the criminal. All three are very different potential lawsuits. It's worth mentioning that there are also Arizona revised statutes, ARS codes, dealing with aviation under Title 28, Chapter 25. I will mention them a bit later, although no charges have been filed in Arizona. Let's begin with administrative law. This is a body of law created by the FAA and also enforced by the FAA. You will recognize when I'm talking about administrative law because I will use 14 CFR followed by a part number. The 14 stands for Aeronautics and Space, Title 14. The CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. 
Now, if a person violates these CFRs, there are certain penalties that could include airman or medical certificate, revocation or suspension, and or civil fines. Let's look now at civil law. Civil law is where a person or company sues another person or company in civil court. There are two bodies of civil law that come to mind. The first is tort law and the second is contract law. This case does not deal with contract law. We're only looking at tort law, specifically intentional torts or negligence. Now, intentional torts are those done on purpose. Negligence are not. So in this case, we have negligence, which was the cause of action for wrongful death of Heidi Sue Dowland. And lastly, we'll look at criminal law. This case, the Anderson case, appears in the U.S. District Court of Arizona, Federal Crime for Aviation, and it falls under Title 18 of the United States Code and Title 49, so you'll see that in this case. The penalties for this includes imprisonment and or fines. I mentioned earlier that Arizona has a body of aviation law that exists in Title 28, Chapter 25, we do note, however, that this case is in the federal district court in the state of Arizona and not in Arizona state court. ARS 288280, careless or reckless aircraft operation. A person who operates an aircraft in the air or on the ground or on the water in a careless or reckless manner that endangers the life or property of another is guilty of a class one misdemeanor. ARS 288322 requires that aircraft in Arizona be registered with the state of Arizona, in addition to federal registration with the FAA. ARS 288325 just says that the registration fee with the Arizona Department of Transportation is $5. ARS 28-8328 discusses what happens when you fail to register your aircraft with the state of Arizona, and then ARS 28-8347 outlines the civil penalties. And ARS 28-8272 requires you to register your aircraft with the FAA if you are going to fly this aircraft in the state of Arizona. And lastly, we have three ARS codes that could have been useful in a civil case for wrongful death. ARS 288273, a pilot is responsible for damage to a person or property that is caused by aircraft directed by the pilot or under the pilot's control, and that results from the negligence of the pilot. We have ARS 288274, the law applicable to torts, on land determines the liability of the owner of one aircraft to the owner of another aircraft or to aeronauts or passengers on either aircraft for damage caused by a collision on land or in the air. And lastly, ARS 288208, any crime, tort or other wrong that is committed by or against an aeronaut or passenger while in flight over this state is governed by the law of this state. The law of the state determines whether damage by or to an aircraft while in flight over the state is a tort, a crime, or any other wrong by or against the owner of the aircraft. Let's dive now into the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB investigation. On January 13, 2019, at about 1045 Mountain Standard Time, a 1958 Piper PA-22-160 Tri-Pacer was substantially damaged when it struck trees and terrain in Hualapai Mountain Park, Arizona. There was no fire. The non-certificated male pilot received serious injuries and his female passenger received fatal injuries. According to relatives of the passenger, the airplane departed from Kingman Airport, IGM, and was destined for Glendale Municipal Airport, GEU, about 132 miles to the southeast. The accident occurred during the U.S. government's sequestration and no NTSB, FAA, Piper or Lycoming personnel responded to the accident site. 
Responding agencies included the Mojave County Sheriff's Department and Mojave County Public Works Parks Division. The wreckage was recovered later that evening by air transport and taken to their facility in Phoenix, Arizona. This map shows the locations from IGM, which is Kingman, to the site of the plane crash of the aircraft 9227 Delta, and then down in the right-hand corner, the location of Glendale Airport, GEU. The crash site was approximately 9.8 nautical miles from Kingman Airport. This aerial photo shows the location of the crash site of the aircraft 9227 Delta to the road. And this is the aircraft wreckage when it came to rest. And here's more of the NTSB investigation. No fuel was recovered from the airplane. And more importantly, no fuel tank cap was found on either wing. But when a donor fuel cap was installed on the necks, they rotated smoothly and locked into place. The NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, concluded their investigation and issued their final report, listing the cause of the accident to be that the student pilot failed to secure the fuel caps, which led to the fuel being siphoned overboard and the engine being starved of fuel led to the total loss of engine power. And looking back at the NTSB report, um, I decided to investigate Pierce Ferry Airport, identifier Lima 25 in Meadview. Come to find out it's a little dirt strip, a public use airport in Mojave County that's owned by the National Park Service. You're about to hear from Cary Grant, who's a professor here at Embry-Riddle. As you can see, he's also a retired airline pilot, among other things. Carrie is also a flight instructor, and in his spare time, just like myself, he volunteers at the FAA safety team out of the Scottsdale FISDO. Carrie also holds two ground instructor ratings and his remote pilot certificate. And this tri-pacer is Carrie's. It is a 1957 model, unlike the crashed aircraft, which was a 1958 model, and it's a tailwheel aircraft instead of a tricycle gear, but the similarities were such that Carrie has important insight to share about this crash. Thank you, Sarah, for allowing me to comment on some of these pictures. And as I was looking through them, some differences started to highlight themselves, uh, pop out that I was viewing at. As Sarah said, I have my airplane uh, down in Deer Valley and it's a 57 but it's a fabric covered airplane and I noticed the accident airplane uh, with all the crinkles and scrape marks told me this was a metal covered airplane which is very unusual for the PA-22s. This is a great view of the aircraft uh, that came down on its right side and what really stands out on this picture, besides all the damage along the right side of the fuselage, is looking at the prop, you can see the bottom prop is deformed and scraped, but not as much as you'd expect it to be if, if uh, it was turning. So the fact that the top blade is undamaged and only the bottom blade is damaged and the, the damage along the nose cone and the engine tells me that prop was pretty stationary at the time of impact. Left side of the airplane was relatively unscathed, whereas the right side, where it came down, took the blunt of the trauma. And this view from the head of the airplane looking back into the cockpit shows how the passenger would really have taken uh, most of the trauma from hitting uh, with the airplane on the ground. So there's a lot of deformation there. And that's also a good view of the prop, again, showing that the bottom prop 
has the scrape marks, whereas the top prop just escaped having any damage to it, an another indication that the engine was not turning at the time of impact. This is a good view of looking in the cockpit of both airplanes. And what you can see from this view on the right in my airplane is that the front seats are a lot lower than the seats in the accident airplanes. The, the seats in the accident airplane are not the original seats. They didn't have that high back to it. Looking in the cockpit on, on the right, you can also see into the back seat uh, area, and that is not visible in the accident airplane. The back seat was not there, and this is a good view also of the lap belts and how they attach up at the, the ceiling and down to the uh, four-point connection system. This is looking into the passenger, well, the, the front seat compartment. You have to get in from the right side of the airplane, whether you're the passenger or the pilot. So the pilot has to climb in first and the passenger follows. Good view of the seat belts and the shoulder harnesses, how they attach. One of the things I noticed is on the accident airplane with the, the passenger's shoulder harnesses, the left strap fastener is bent where it uh, inserts into the metal, through the metal tab that goes into the, the buckle and the flap. So there was some obvious stress put on that uh, shoulder harness, whether that was done at the time of the accident or afterwards, but uh, you, can, you can see that it's not straight uh, just about uh, down at the bottom left of the corner, whereas the pilot's buckles uh, look fairly pristine and intact. right side of the airplane here with the front door uh, missing in this picture. Uh, you can see it closed on my airplane on the right side. The seat belt is hanging out and it's hard to tell from this picture whether there's any deformation. This would have been the passenger's seat belt metal tab that the shoulder harnesses would have attached to. And uh, I can't see any damage on that. Just behind the passenger door is the baggage compartment door and that uh, has a little bit of uh, breakage in the seam there. You can just see it bulging a little bit but uh, the, the baggage door stayed closed and then you can see all the damage back along the fuselage to the elevator and the top of the rudder. Nice view here on the left side of the airplane looking into the passenger compartment in the back of the airplane. And you'll notice on the right side of my airplane, the back seat is there. And on the accident airplane, the back seat is not there. You can see all the way back into the uh, baggage area. That's unusual to have the back seat missing completely. This picture takes a little bit of explaining what you're looking at. On the left side, of course, is the accident airplane. And it's a little bit confusing because what we're seeing is the rear door that the recovery team has opened all the way uh, against the fuselage. So you can see that it, it should close against the, the opening there. And the, the outline of the door fits the opening uh, in the fuselage. The gear is folded up against the, the door by the recovery team, and it, it, it doesn't have the gear, the tire on it. And you can actually see the axle uh, just out in front of the door. And it looks to me like the, the gear legs may have been fabric covered because they don't uh, have the scrapes and the tears that the, the metal has. On the right side, I've included these pictures to show you how the rear seat area looks. And uh, I was uh, performing my annual, so all the floorboards were up looking underneath there. So you can see the, the sling that forms the rear seat. And I have the rear seat out sitting on the, the floor there with the, the cushion and the support bar that supports that seat uh, sitting down there on the ground. So with, without the rear seat in, there's quite a bit of space back there for cargo or, or 
bags or whatever else you want to throw in there. Uh, so, and the accident airplane, that would have opened up a lot of space for carrying items. Here we're looking inside the cockpit from the back seat area. One of the things I noticed where I have my radio stack, there were no uh, similar type radios, although there is the transponder and the radio at the bottom. But that left a large area on top that appears to have some sort of uh, device bracket, such as a GPS. So I'm wondering, where is that GPS? And uh, they were flying out to some dirt strips up in Mojave County. I'm sure they were using some sort of GPS to uh, navigate their way back and forth. So that's a, a question I had. The other thing you can see from this picture, comparing the, the two views of the cockpit, you can obviously see the the deformation the right yoke uh, took. Uh, it's bent forward and down towards the right in this, in this view. We have a zoomed in view of the magneto switch position here. And what immediately caught my eye on the accident airplane on the left is that the switch is in the both position. The Accident Investigation Board mentioned that it was in the both position and the key was not there. They could not find the key. So that, that means that they were flying this airplane essentially with the mags hot all the time. The Pacer has a unique way of starting engines. You put the key in and all you're doing is you are turning on the mags, either the, the right mag, left mag, or both. You actually start the airplane with a starter button that's underneath the pilot's seat. Uh, on my airplane you can see that the, the key can only be removed in the off position. There's a NTSB alert for operators that specifically warns about this incident that uh, you should not be able to take the key out in any position other than the off position. And if you can, the switch is defective and needs to be replaced. Uh, this was a re result, the alert was a result of an accident where the gentleman was moving the prop and the key was in his pocket. And the prop went off and it ended up being a fatal accident and the switch was not in the off position, it was uh, in the right position. So this is, this is a critical area and it, it shows some pattern of flying the airplane in less than an airworthy condition. This is the engine tachometer, and it shows the needle at the zero position. If the engine had been turning at the time of impact, there should have been a witness mark and even froze the needle at the position at which it was indicating the RPM. So the fact that the, the needle is at zero RPM here is another indication that the engine was not turning at the time of impact. We're looking up underneath the instrument panel here at, at the control yokes and the, the bicycle chain that goes across the sprocket. On the left side arrow is a U-channel and that U-channel should be completely straight. It uh, serves as a guide for the yokes coming in and out. Uh, you can see it's bent to the, to the right at uh, just about a 40 to 40 to 45 degree angle. The second arrow at the top of the T uh, shows a stress bend in the crossbar there. This uh, the sprockets and the chains. So the right yoke was the one that was bent down and to the right and it transferred that stress into the, the uh, T bar here. And it's obvious signs that there was a lot of stress on there. That's a, a fairly heavy gauge uh, circular tube on there, so there was a lot of stress on that. The Pacer fuel selector valve is on the left sidewall by the pilot's left knee. It only has three positions, so you can put it in left, right at the top, and then if you move it over towards the nine o'clock to the six o'clock position, 
That's the off position. Uh, you can only move it counterclockwise. You uh, cannot move this in a clockwise position. So when it hits that off position at the 6 o'clock, you have to move it back towards 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, or uh, the 3 o'clock position. There is no both position on these pacers. There's an, a mall STC that a lot of pilots will do. The seaplane version of this came with that because it adds a left door, but the stock pacer uh, only had that three position left, right, and off. So you cannot feed the engine from both tanks simultaneously. This view shows the uh, fuel selector valve with the sidewall covering removed and you can see the insulation underneath. And what's interesting with this view is you can see that this airplane at one time was blue because the blue paint is still back there on that uh, original insulation uh, running from the fuel lines back there. So just a, an interesting side note. I also noticed several of the scrape marks you could see some blue paint coming through on the outside of the fuselage and this was just confirmation that the airplane at one time had been painted this blue and that was a common blue uh, for many of the the tri-pacers at Piper offered. The accident investigation team here has uh, isolated the fuel selector valve. Uh, from the sidewall, they've taken it out, removed the lines. You can see the, the plate, this is looking edge on with the handle attached to the right side and that the handle is in the left position. It's not quite in the full detent and they're showing the inside of the selector valve uh, is not quite open all the way. There's supposed to be real uh, noticeable crisp detents in each position as you move this handle. That's one of the inspection items on the annual. The board commented that this selector valve uh, did move in all the proper positions but that it was very stiff and difficult to move. The accident team uh, report mentions that the flaps were down. However, the photograph of the cockpit on the left side does not substantiate that statement. The flap handle is shown in the up fully extended position. Uh, pictures on my airplane on the right shows where the flap handle is in the down position. It's all the way almost to the floor. And then in the full extended position, it's up as it would be in the accident airplane uh, on the left side. So I think that's a discrepancy in the report. And I've got the next slide will show uh, why I think that as well, sub substantiating that statement. This is the left wing. Uh, the right wing is at the top of the, the picture there and it was uh, pretty well accordioned in and, and hard to determine anything from the from the damage. But on the left wing, uh, the wing is upside down here. You can see the lift struts in the, in the front. The arrow is pointing to the flap, which is in the down position. And the, uh, the description of the wing actually says the wing, the flap was down in the overextended position. You know, when you put the flaps down, uh, they lock into place. So. The only way you could get it down into the overextended position is if the flaps were extended at the, the time of impact. We have the accident airplane wings on the, the left, both the left and right wing showing there on the, on the left side of the, the picture here. They're supposed to be placarded with the type of fuel that goes in and the quantity you can see that there is a, a placard on the left wing, but you can't read it. And the right wing appears not to have any type of placard at all. This is another item that should be checked on the annual inspection as, as a required items for, for placards, and another indication that the airplane was not flown in an airworthy condition. Right, this view is taken from a ladder that's in front of the airplane showing the top of both of my tanks. One of the things that uh, if you're down and you're a short person, you cannot see the top of the, the wings and those fuel caps. 
So I always make a point of walking around the back, looking up there, making sure I have replaced those caps on top of the fuel filler necks. Uh, and that's something that you should do prior to every departure. This view of the accident airplane was the, the, one of the first indications I had a eureka moment that this was a metalized airplane. So I was looking at the back here, noticing all the scrape marks, and saw the seam running along the fuselage uh, from the, uh, the lap joints of the aluminum. And on the metalized pacers, it gives the top of the fuselage a more rounded appearance than it does for the fabric covered ones. Looking at the damage on the left elevator, you can see the scrape marks that have exposed the blue paint that's underneath. So just another indication that this airplane was uh, the Piper Blue at one time. The far left picture shows the jack screw uh, trim for the accident airplane. One of the things I noticed looking at this was how dry the Acme threads were on that jack screw. Uh, the two pictures on the right show my uh, jack screw in the full uh, trim up and down positions. And you can see there's a lot of grease uh, in the threads and along the entire uh, pulley length of that. The one on the left of the accident airplane it looks to me like that had not been properly greased in quite some time. What grease is there is very dry and hard, waxy at, at the bottom along the trim pulley, and the screws themselves look bare and dry, and I don't see any evidence of any grease uh, in the threads and the, the uh, trim saddle. So another, another indication that the airplane was probably not in an airworthy condition. Thank you, Carrie. That was awesome. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to do this for us. Let's talk a little bit about the FAA investigation into the CFR violations, which is administrative law. The NTSB final report in its analysis begins as follows. The student pilot was conducting a cross-country flight with one passenger on board. 6189 clearly says a student pilot may not act as pilot in command of an aircraft that is carrying a passenger. The NTSB investigation analysis continues. According to the passenger's sister at 10.01, her sister had sent her a text which stated that she and the pilot had taken off and were heading to an airport about 50 miles to the south to obtain fuel. The investigation was unable to determine whether the pilot obtained fuel at this airport. At 10.38, while at the second airport, the passenger telephoned a relative and stated that they would take off shortly for the destination airport. Although the actual departure time from the second airport could not be determined, the sister stated that she expected the airplane to arrive at the destination airport about 11.30. By 12.15, the sister called a local sheriff's office and search and rescue to locate the airplane because it was overdue. First responders found the airplane, which had impacted trees and came to rest inverted in a ravine in a park about 10 miles south of the second airport. The pilot was seriously injured and the passenger was fatally injured. The pilot reported to the first responders that the airplane experienced an electrical failure and he tried to turn around. However, the engine lost power. Almost all the airplane components remained attached to the wreckage. The propeller damage signatures were consistent with a complete lack of engine power at impact. Examination of the airframe, engine and propeller revealed no evidence of any pre-impact mechanical malfunctions or failures that would have precluded normal operation. The first responders did not note the presence of any fuel on scene. The airplane was equipped with two separate fuel tanks, one in each wing. Each tank had a dedicated filler neck with a removable cap. Neither cap was found at the accident site or in the recovered wreckage. There was no evidence of the caps 
being installed at impact. The wreckage evidence was consistent with a loss of engine power due to fuel, fuel exhaustion. The absence of the fuel caps likely resulted in the fuel being siphoned overboard during flight. Aside from the absence of fuel caps and fuel, no evidence was found of any other pre-impact mechanical malfunctions. The Airplane Flying Handbook details a pre-flight assessment of the aircraft, which involves inspecting that those caps are secure. 14 CFR 91-103, in its pre-flight action, a pilot is required to check fuel requirements. So we know that there was no fuel on board this aircraft because the caps were not secured, which then leads us to another CFR, 14 CFR 91-151, which makes it a requirement that if you're flying during the day, which in this case Anderson was, you are required to carry enough fuel to get you to your destination, plus an additional 30 minutes. And of course, this reg was also violated. Further reading of the NTSB Accident Investigation's final report analysis details the following. The pilot was hospitalized for several days, and a review of pilot's post-accident hospital records revealed that he had diabetes and used an insulin pump, which was corroborated by a review of his previous medical records. However, insufficient evidence was found to determine whether the pilot was impaired due to diabetic complications at the time of the accident. Thus, whether the pilot's diabetes or some other medical factor contributed to the accident could not be determined. Several attempts were made to obtain a statement from the pilot, however he refused to provide any information to the investigation. A brief search of the FAA Airman Registry reveals that Christopher Adam Anderson indeed had a third class medical issued January of 2014 and no pilot certificates, which would make sense since he was a student pilot. And here we see the class three medical without waivers or limitations, no mention of the diabetes whatsoever. Oh, and take note of the two hours of logged flight time. In the NTSB accident investigation, it was mentioned that the pilot reported no medical conditions or use of medications on his third class medical certificate application. However, a review of his medical records noted that he had diabetes and used fast acting insulin and an insulin pump. And according to 14 CFR 67313A, diabetes is disqualifying for a third class medical certificate if it requires treatment with insulin or other blood glucose lowering medications. Here's a snippet from 14 CFR 67313, the general medical standards for a third class airman medical certificate and under letter A, no established medical history or clinical diagnosis of diabetes mellitus that requires insulin or any other hypoglycemic drug for control. When Anderson applied for his third class medical in January of 2014, he reported a single healthcare provider visit in the preceding three years for cold and flu. And therefore, he was issued a combined third-class medical certificate and student pilot certificate without limitation. However, the NTSB accident investigation report shows that contrary to the pilot's representation, the records indicated that the reason for this visit had been to establish care with a local primary doctor and endocrinologist. And at the visit, Anderson reported a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes since 2002. He even mentioned being hospitalized in 2010 for diabetes-related severe metabolic disturbance.
So if Anderson falsified his application for his third class medical, he's also in violation of 14 CFR 67403, which says that no person may make or cause to be made a fraudulent or intentionally false statement on any application for a medical certificate. The penalty for which is suspension or revocation of all airmen, ground instructor and medical certificates and ratings held by that person. Lying on a federal document, the FAA medical application, is not only an admin administrative law issue, as you saw in the CFRs, but is also a federal crime that can get you five years in federal prison and or a $250,000 fine. I'm going to explain this in just a second, but keep in mind that this is not going to be one of the charges that Anderson faces. 18 U.S. Code 1001, speaking about knowingly and willfully falsifying, concealing or covering up any material fact or making a false writing or document knowing the same to contain any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or entry. It goes on to talk about the imprisonment for not more than five years. And 18 U.S. Code 3571, speaking of the fine of not more than $250,000. So I'm reading the NTSB's medical factual report, which also says there were no records of any pre-flight briefing. Well, 14 CFR 91103 requires that we get a briefing before flight. Here's the actual reg. So on October 30th of 2018, the passenger purchased the airplane. An FAA deregistration letter dated December 31, 2018, that was addressed to the passenger stated that the registration was suspended because it had not been renewed following the October 28 transfer of sale to her. So she owned the airplane, not a pilot, and wasn't registered. And Anderson flew an unregistered aircraft, violating 14 CFR 47.3. Here's the reg, which says that you may not operate an aircraft unless it's been registered by the owner. A brief search of the FAA aircraft registry for the accident aircraft 9227 Delta shows that in fact the registration was cancelled. In addition to being a CFR violation to not register your aircraft, it is also a federal requirement under 49 U.S. Code 44103. And here's the cincture. An operator of an aircraft shall make available for inspection a certificate of registration for the aircraft when requested by a U.S. government, state, or local law enforcement officer. Now, us pilots are used to this, and we commonly refer this to this as a ramp check or a ramp inspection, where an FAA official or law enforcement can come up to the pilot as they're pre-flighting the airplane or after they've landed doing their post-flight and say, hey, I would like to see these documents. And you're duty-bound to show them these documents, the registration, the airworthiness, the weight and balance, and so on, as well as your pilot certificates, your medicals, your photo ID, things of that nature. So in the, I want to say, five years, perhaps, that Anderson was flying around Arizona, not once did he get asked for these documents. Hmm, makes you wonder. Having an expired registration leads to another problem. The airworthiness certification is now considered ineffective. So without registration, the aircraft is not authorized for flights. This means that every flight after October of 2018 was with an unairworthy aircraft. The FAA sent Heidi Dowland a letter in December of 2018 telling her that she needed to register her aircraft. Now, Heidi was not a pilot, so I highly doubt she knew what to do with this, but it did give instructions on registering your aircraft. 
This FAA document shows the transfer of ownership from Beach It LLC to somebody whose name is scratched out and Heidi Dowland's name replacing it. And now to the mystery of the missing logbooks. After the crash, both Hannah and Sue Ellen had searched the hangar for these logbooks, but it appeared to both of them that the hangar door had been pried open and the logbooks were missing. 18 U.S. Code 1519 deals with the destruction, alteration of falsification of records in federal investigations. Well, could these missing logbooks have been destroyed? Other questions that come to mind include aircraft insurance. Typically, an operational aircraft requires to be airworthy in order to be insured. But upon reading the NTSB accident investigation file, I noticed there are other issues, such as Anderson carried multiple passengers multiple times prior to the accident. And then there's mention of adding a lawn chair to the cargo compartments and tying it down with cargo straps. This is a letter out of the NTSB accident investigation file that details, again, carrying passengers multiple times, borrowing the aircraft before it was purchased for him, and also flying with passengers that were unrestrained. Then next up, let's talk about the documents you must have in your possession as a pilot, because yesterday when I mentioned the registration issue, I neglected to go into this detail. So in the Airplane Flying Handbook, which is the FAA's guide to pilots and, and people who are flight training learn from these books, they list a bunch of things that must be in the pilot's possession prior to going on a flight. So a couple of these stand out to this case. The obviously airworthiness certificate, there was no mention of that in in the NTSB records. The registration certificate we already know was it was expired. We need a radio station license if the flight's going outside the US. So th this wouldn't have been needed in this instance. Operating limitations, which are in the form of an FAA approved flight manual or a POH pilot's operating handbook, placards on the plane and so on and so forth. There's a current weight and balance data sheet that you fill out to make sure before each flight that you're within limits, both weight-wise and center of gravity-wise. And then a compass correction card. Um, and then lastly, the external data plate. So I'll go into these in a little more detail. Now, during flight training, pilots normally learn how to remember these documents by using a mnemonic, which is ARROW. A-R-R-O-W, which stands for Airworthiness Registration Radio License, Operating Handbook and Weight and Balance. And I'm going to go over the different laws which require this n right now. 14 CFR 91203 gives us the first two, the A and the R, an appropriate and current airworthiness certificate and an effective U.S. registration certificate issued to its owner. As you can see, no person may operate a civil aircraft unless the airworthiness certificate is displayed at the cabin or cockpit entrance so that it is legible to passengers or crew. And we really did not um, get into that in the NTSB investigation as to whether that was available. And just one little note on airworthiness. It's not enough that you have this airworthiness certificate on display for passengers to look at. But it's also important that the airworthiness of the aircraft is tied to the required inspections. Like I mentioned in the first video, your annual inspection, your air, airworthiness directives, and all the other things. You, you check the ELT, the emergency locator transmitter. You check your transponder. There's a whole slew of things that have to be checked. And again, in this case, we have missing logbooks, so we have no idea if any of this is applicable. And then this uh, 14 CFR 91.9 is um, requiring that you have the operating limitations, the O in the arrow portion. So this reg 919 um, talks about 
uh, operating limitations and that includes placards and markings. So I've put a screenshot of the accident um, aircraft and just to illustrate the placards and markings, it's these little stickers here with, for example, drain all fuel sumps before first flight of each day or um, brake, pull on, so that you know that pulling is on and pushing is off. So these are what they call placards and markings and there's a warning label down here. You can see left of the ignition switch. In addition to all the CFR violations that I have just mentioned, the FAA also uses a catch-all, 9113. No person may operate an aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another. I'd like to turn our attention next to the student pilot certificate for Christopher Anderson, especially with respect to the address on file with the FAA. In searching the address on the Avapai County Assessor's Office, it came to my attention he was not the owner of the house. Looking at the titles for this house, for this property, I noticed three different owners in 2011, 2016 and 2019. First of all, Michael Timothy Henriksen, you remember the bloke from the aircraft that was sold to Heidi that later Anderson crashed in 2019. But the property was sold to him in 2011. Then he sold it in 2016. Then those people sold it to the current owners in 2019. So there's a CFR 14 CFR 6160 which requires that a pilot change their address on file with the FAA within 30 days of moving. So my question now becomes, if Anderson lived at Hendrickson's house between 2011 and 2016 when Hendrickson owned it, assuming that's why he put it on his medical in 2014, why didn't Anderson report a change of address in 2016 when the house was sold. Hmm. Knowing what we know now about Anderson's um, on the administrative law side, do we know whether the FAA attorney has filed a complaint and a summons to emergency suspend or revoke Anderson's student pilot certificate following the accident? Well, here's what typically happens when something like this occurs and the FAA gets wind because of the NTSB investigation that the pilot may be at some fault. What typically starts the process and the ball rolling is a call from an aviation safety inspector from the local FISDO, which in our case would be down in Scottsdale. And if the airman does not answer the phone calls, what's typically done then is perhaps an email or a letter or both to get the airmen to cooperate with the investigation. But we have heard many times in these documents that Anderson was not complying with the investigation. So in normal fashion, after the aviation safety inspector decides that they can't get a hold of the airmen, they will take the file up, to, up the chain to an FAA attorney on the East Coast. And then the FAA attorney typically files a complaint and a summons to the pilot saying, in this case, I'm pretty sure it might have been an emergency suspension or revocation of the student pilot certificate and medical. But the airman has 20 days to respond or loses the case by default. And unless the airman responds and it goes in front of an administrative law judge for a hearing, it won't end up on the NTSB's legal database. And that's probably why we don't see it there today. So this is the legal department of the NTSB where you would file an appeal if you were to file one. They have a searchable database. And so I looked for the, anything from Anderson and found nothing. So that leads me to believe that he did not appeal it. 
So my next step is to file a FOIA request, which is a Freedom of Information Act request, to the FAA to see if they did indeed suspend or uh, revoke his student pilot certificate and medical. I called the Scottsdale FISDO, the Flight Standards District Office, to speak to the Aviation Safety Inspector who had investigated the case back in 2019. I am curious as to why the FAA did not pursue Anderson for the dozen or so FAR violations. Unfortunately, I am told Thomas Dickerson retired two years ago. So my next move was to file a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request to the FAA seeking documentation to see if they had indeed enacted any enforcement action against Anderson for all these CFR violations. In September of this year, I received an answer to my FOIA request. And it turns out that in September of 2019, the FAA revoked Anderson's student pilot certificate and third class medical. It seems like very small punishment because I've listed at least 11 CFR violations. And then there's the other thing. Anderson received his student pilot certificate in January of 2014. At the time, he was under 40 years old, which would have meant that his student pilot certificate and third class medical was valid for 60 calendar months or five years meaning that it would have expired naturally on January 31st of 2019, just a few weeks after the crash, which happened on January 13. Let's shift gears now to the civil case, because if I were to be a relative of Heidi's, I would have probably tried to sue Anderson for wrongful death of my loved one. After a brief search of the clerk of the Superior Court in Yavapai County, I found a probate case from 2019 with respect to the estate of Heidi Sue Dowland. And after downloading and reading 122 pages, the conclusion was this. Recall at the beginning of the accident investigation, Heidi's older sister, Hannah, had mentioned how mysteriously three life insurance policies that were supposed to go to her three kids were changed into the name of Chris Adam Anderson and so in this probate case the family gave up their rights to sue Anderson for wrongful death in exchange for a small portion of these life insurance proceeds so the three kids would at least have some inheritance. Makes me very sad. You've heard me explain the administrative law side of things with the FAA. You've heard me briefly mention the civil case, which did not happen. And now we get to the last of the three facets of this case, the criminal side. This first document is the arrest warrant for Christopher Adam Anderson, which was sealed prior to his arrest. It lists three different U.S. codes, 49 U.S. Code 46506-1, 18 U.S. Code 1112, and 49 U.S. Code 46306-Bravo-7. I'm going to talk about each one individually. 49 U.S. Code 46506, subsection 1, makes criminal certain acts that occur in an aircraft. And amongst those, we find manslaughter under Title 18 U.S. Code 1112. 18 U.S. Code 1112 defines manslaughter. And we're interested in the involuntary part. So involuntary means that in the commission of an unlawful act not amounting to a felony or in the commission in an unlawful manner, or without due caution and circumspection of a lawful act which might produce death. The penalty for involuntary manslaughter is going to be imprisonment not more than eight years, a fine or both. And lastly, 49 U.S. Code 46306 Bravo 7, which 
details, knowingly and willfully serving or attempting to serve in any capacity as an airman without an airman's certificate authorizing the individual to serve in that capacity. Following Anderson's arrest on January 7 of 2024 by the Washington County Sheriff's Office, he was detained at the Purgatory Correctional Facility until January 17 when he made his way back to Arizona to stand trial. A curious thing I noted on his address that he gave was that it differed from the FAA medical and student pilot certificate. The address he gave was in Meadview, where he frequently flew to and from Prescott and where he flew the morning of the crash. According to the Mojave County Assessor's Office, this property belongs to an Anderson Allen and Aletha. On November 14 of 2023, in the U.S. District Court for the District of Arizona, a grand jury charged Christopher Adam Anderson on three counts. Count one, on or about January 13, 2019, near Kingman, Arizona, Christopher Adam Anderson flew an aircraft with a passenger without proper certification where that flight crashed resulting in Heidi's death. And Anderson did wantonly and recklessly disregard human life and his actions were the proximate cause of Heidi's death. Count two, on or about December 15, 2018, in the District of Arizona, Christopher Adam Anderson piloted an aircraft with a passenger, knowing that his airman certificate did not allow a student pilot to act as pilot in command of an aircraft carrying a passenger. Count three, on or about January 13 of 2019, Christopher Adam Anderson served as a pilot of an aircraft with a passenger knowing that his airman certificate did not allow a student pilot to act as pilot in command of an aircraft that is carrying a passenger. Representing the United States in this case, from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix, is Abby Broughton Marsh. This indictment was originally sealed until the arrest of Christopher Adam Anderson. Assisting Abby Broughton Marsh is Gary Restaino, another U.S. attorney. The warrant for his arrest was issued on the 15th of November, 2023. Following the arrest of Christopher Adam Anderson, the case is assigned to Magistrate Judge Paul Kohler in the U.S. District Court of Utah. On January 8, 2024, Magistrate Judge Paul Kohler ordered a hearing, an initial appearance, Rule 5 hearing, for January 11 at 10 a.m. Rule 5, under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, states that a person making an arrest within the United States must take the defendant without unnecessary delay before a magistrate judge. So on January 11, 2024, Christopher Adam Anderson appears in front of Judge Paul Kohler. The court appoints a federal public defender, Rob Hunt, as his counsel, and then the defendant is advised of his rights. The defendant also waives his identity hearing, and he acknowledges his identity on record. The government sought detention in this matter and the court heard the argument regarding this issue of detention. For the reasons stated on the record, the court ordered the defendant detained in the U.S. Marshal Service custody for transportation to the charging district, which was Arizona. Also on January 11 was entered a waiver of Rule 5C3 hearing. 5C3 in the Rules of Federal Criminal Procedure explain procedures in a district other than where the offense was allegedly committed. 
Then the commitment to another district was signed by the magistrate judge Paul Kohler to transfer Christopher Adam Anderson from the District of Utah to the District of Arizona. Next on the docket, we see a notice of transmittal that the case had been transferred to the District of Arizona per the order of the judge on um, January 11, 2024. And then all minute entries were sent to Arizona. This is the document unsealing the matter, which had been sealed since November 14 of 23. But the court, sua sponte, which means on their own accord, had unsealed this case on the fourth day of March 2024. And this was signed by the Honorable Deborah M. Fine. Also on the 4th of March, we see a notice of appearance by attorney C. Kenneth Ray II. It would appear that Christopher Adam Anderson has retained him as counsel. So this is the attorney advising the court that he is now representing the defendant in all further proceedings in this matter. C. Kenneth Ray II is a criminal defense attorney out of Prescott, Arizona. March 4, 2024, in front of Magistrate Judge Deborah M. Fine, this was the time set for initial appearance and arraignment. However, defendant just retained counsel and requests additional time to allow pretrial services to interview the defendant. The court finds it appropriate to reset the arraignment and detention hearing to allow pretrial services to interview the defendant and provide a report to the court and counsel, as well as to allow defense counsel to be present in person for these proceedings. Defendant shall remain temporarily detained. As required by Rule 5F, the United States is ordered to produce all information required by Brady v. Maryland and its progeny. Not doing so in a timely manner may result in sanctions, including exclusion of evidence, adverse jury instructions, dismissal of charges, and contempt proceedings. So what is this Brady v. Maryland case? It was a case where the U.S. Supreme Court addressed the issue of prosecutors suppressing evidence favorable to the accused. The Brady decision ruled that the defense has the right to examine all evidence that may be of an exculpatory nature. The prosecution will not only release evidence that the defendant might be guilty of a crime, but also release all evidence that might show that the defendant is innocent as well. Rule 5F requires judges to inform the prosecutors of their obligation to produce exculpatory info and provides that courts may hold prosecutors accountable if they do not comply with a Brady order. Appearing for the United States was Assistant U.S. Attorney Todd Allison, and for Christopher Adam Anderson was C. Kenneth Ray II. The defendant was present and in custody, and the arraignment and, and detention hearing was set for March 6th at 9.30 a.m. in courtroom 303 in Phoenix. March 6th, 2024, the arraignment and detention hearing occurred for Christopher Adam Anderson. The defendant entered a plea of not guilty to all penny counts. And the detention hearing was held whereby the parties proceeded by way of proffer and arguments. And then defendant's exhibit one was admitted into evidence. The defendant was ordered to be released on his own reconnaissance with conditions. And the conditions of release are then reviewed with the defendant on the record. Appearing for the United States was Assistant U.S. Attorney Glenn McCormick. And for the defendant, Attorney C. Kenneth Ray II. The defendant was present and in custody. Pre-trial motions were to be due within 21 days. And a jury trial was set for May 7 at 9 a.m. in courtroom 505. The exhibit list by the defendant includes Exhibit 1, Letters. 
I'm going to review now the order setting the conditions of release. It is ordered that defendant is subject to the following conditions and shall appear at all proceedings as required and to surrender for service of any sentence imposed, shall not def commit any federal, state or local crime, shall cooperate in the collection of a DNA sample if the collection is authorized by 42 U.S. Code 14135A, shall report as directed to the U.S. Pretrial Services, shall reside at the address on file with pretrial services and immediately advise his attorney and pretrial services in writing for approval prior to any change in residence address, mailing address, and telephone number. Shall not travel outside of the state of Nevada unless prior court or pretrial services permission is granted to travel elsewhere, except that with at least two days prior notice to pretrial services, the defendant may travel directly to the prosecuting district and through all states and counties between the defendant's authorized state of residence and the prosecuting district for court purposes and lawyer conferences. The defendant shall not travel out of the United States unless prior court approval is granted to do so. Shall avoid all direct and indirect contact with any persons who are considered alleged victims, including family, potential witnesses, co-defendants, Contact exclusively through counsel is allowed. Shall maintain weekly contact with his attorney by Friday noon of each week. Shall surrender all travel documents to pretrial services by March 11, 2024. Shall not obtain a passport or other travel documents during the pendency of these proceedings. Shall maintain or actively seek employment, combination of work school, if physically and medically able to do so, and provide proof of such to pretrial services. Shall not operate an aircraft. Shall not possess or attempt to acquire any firearm, destructive device, or other dangerous weapon or ammunition. Shall consume no alcohol. The defendant shall participate in alcohol treatment, submit to alcohol testing, and make co-payment toward the cost of such services as directed by pretrial services. The defendant shall not obstruct or attempt to obstruct or tamper in any fashion with the efficiency and accuracy of any substance use testing or monitoring. Shall not possess or use a narcotic drug or other controlled substance unless prescribed for the defendant by a licensed medical practitioner. And lastly, shall surrender Mojave County credentials to pretrial services by March 11 or within three days of receipt of such. What follows in these documents is the advice of penalties and sanctions should Christopher not comply with the above. And the Honorable Deborah M. Fine signed the order releasing the defendant on March 6th of 2024. What we have here is the minute order re-exhibits as to Christopher Adam Anderson. It is hereby ordered that the exhibits marked whether or not received as evidence in the above entitled case at the time of the detention hearing, which concluded on March 6, 2024, are returned to respective counsel. Counsel are directed to retain custody of the exhibits until the case has been completely terminated, including all appeals pursuant to a local rule of Civil Procedure 79.1. On March 18 of 2024, we see the first motion to continue trial and extend the time to file pretrial motions entered by C. Kenneth Ray II. Recall that the trial was supposed to commence on May 7th of 2024. And this motion is also to push the deadline back for the pre-trial motions that should be filed with the court prior. On March 19, the Honorable John J. Tucci signed the order granting the continuance from May 7th to August 6th and also extending the deadlines to file the pretrial motions. We have a notice regarding the passport. The defendant is not permitted to apply for the reissuance of a passport and or 
So the trial on August 6th did not happen. On July 2nd, the status conference was set. The respective councils were to appear before the Honourable Judge John J. Tucci on July 15 of 24. On July 3rd, Anderson's attorney, C. Kenneth Ray, filed a motion to continue the trial and to extend the pre-trial motions deadline. He wanted it extended another 90 days beyond August 6th. Also on July 3rd, Anderson's attorney, C. Kenneth Ray, filed a motion to withdraw as counsel and to appoint counsel. Apparently there is, and I quote, an irreparable conflict between counsel and the defendant relating to his defense, and which includes, but is not limited to, the inability of the defendant to meet the financial requirements of counsel's continued representation and the services of required experts. Additional reasons exist, but counsel cannot disclose pursuant to Ethics Rule 1.6. As a sidebar, under the Arizona Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 1, Client-Lawyer Relationship, a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client, and there are some exceptions which do not apply here. On July 11, the Honorable John J. Tucci granted the motion to continue trial and pretrial motions. A new trial will occur on November 5th at 9 a.m., and the status conference that was originally set for July 15 was vacated. The new pretrial motions deadline is now October 7. On July 25th, we see on the docket a notice regarding a telephonic appearance of the defendant. Anderson is set to appear telephonically on August 2nd at 2.30 p.m. regarding the motion to withdraw and appoint counsel. Recall C. Kenneth Ray is withdrawing as counsel and a new counsel needs to be appointed. On August 2nd, the Honorable Judge John J. Tucci granted the defendant's motion to withdraw and a Criminal Justice Act CJA attorney, Federal Public Defender Diego Rodriguez was named as Anderson's new counsel. A brief search on the Arizona State Bar member directory revealed only one Diego Rodriguez licensed in Arizona. I'm not sure whether this is Anderson's attorney, but that was the Diego Rodriguez I found on file. On October 7, 2024, the Honorable John J. Tucci called for a status conference for the Anderson case, amongst others, for October 21st. Also on October 7, Christopher Anderson's public defender, Diego Rodriguez, filed a motion to continue the trial for yet a third time. The reason being that the case is complex and there is voluminous and specialized discovery and several different government agencies are involved. And furthermore, Diego Rodriguez has a trial conflict with a case in the Superior Court of Arizona at the same time that begins the day before. The next day, the 8th of October, the Honorable John J. Tucci granted the motion to continue the trial. So now we wait until February 4th of 2025. And that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for February 4th, 2025 at 9 a.m. should the trial happen.